Hi, I'm Gina Farrar, reinvention coach, creator and host of Feminine Roadmap Podcast and leader of this amazing global community of women. If you are approaching midlife or are already in the thick of it, welcome home. Please grab a cup of something wonderful and join me for some real talk, practical strategies, and a big dose of sisterhood. I am so glad you're here. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It's Gina here. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife and to live a more vibrant second half. Today, we're going to be talking about social comparison. My guest says that social comparison is a natural function, and it results in strong emotional responses. In midlife, she realized she was creating these responses, and she learned her power to create new ones. She realized her suffering from social comparison was learned and that she could relearn it. And today she's going to share that with us so that we too can make that change. My guest is Dr. Loretta Bruning. She's a brain chemistry expert, the founder of Inner Mammal Institute, the podcast, The Happy Brain, and the author of Status Games, Why We Play and How We Stop. Dr. Loretta, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, I'm super excited about a good brain conversation. And so I would love to hear what led you to this specific mission and message. Um, Like many people, I had a lot of unhappiness around me when I was young. And I thought, I'm going to do everything different. You know, my life is going to be good all the time because I'm not going to repeat all this. And so I always studied psychology and I raised children. I had thousands of students. And I observed, like most people, like, gee, kids are not happy all the time. Students are not happy all the time. And and I was unhappy. And professors' children were not happy. I was a college professor for 25 years. So that motivated me to go deeper and deeper into understanding what triggers our happy brain chemicals. And I was not hearing that from academic psychology. And since that wasn't my primary field, I got to draw my own conclusions instead of having one paradigm forced on me. And a big influence on me that people may know is nature videos. So I really got to understand the um, animal brain inside us and how that's responsible for so many of our ups and downs. Interesting. I love that you took that initiative to think differently, right? It takes a journey to learn new things. So tell me a little bit about that journey. What did you learn from these animal videos that kind of directed your focus? Well, in addition to the videos, in uh, I listened to a lot of self-help books while I was exercising and doing housework. And I hear one little mention of one little animal response to one little chemical and another little mention of another little response to another chemical. So I gathered the information and connected the dots. And I've written a series of about 10 books about this. Um, Status Games is my latest book, which only focuses on one chemical, serotonin, and how that's involved in social comparison. And also I have to... um, Uh, when you say how I did it, um, I took early retirement at age 53 because I didn't like what I was doing and have to give credit to my husband who um, gave me the okie dokie to take early retirement. That's fantastic. You know, it's an incredible thing to, to have the brain we have, right? And to be able to understand it more and more. It's just incredible. Each brain person that I talk to, the more I understand the power of the brain that we have. And so when you took your early retirement, what were your next steps? Well, at that point, I had self-published a book on a different subject, which was closer to my teaching career, which is actually about bribery. And um, I had lived in Africa with the United Nations when I was young, and I had observed that you needed to bribe someone to get your driver's license or your birth certificate or your marriage certificate. And I was wanting to teach my students how to manage that. And 
I was having trouble selling that book. And in fact, it's similar to status games in the way that people were like, you know, if you don't bribe, you might be in the one down position and your inner mammal wants to be in the one up position. So people would say to me, hey, why don't you write a book to teach us how to bribe? Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) So the same people that would do like the moral superiority thing, but would also do that. And so I kept like studying more about human responses and why do people do this? And then I just gravitated more to that. Mm. Now, how does this apply to our lives now, especially in midlife? We've lived so much life. We've done so many things. We're at a lot of crossroads and our responsibilities are shifting and or increasing because of aging parents and children. And, you know, now we have social media, which is a whole another animal to use the phrase <laughs> <laughs> in and of itself. Right. And, and even in our midlife years, I know because of podcasting and social media that there's even pressure on midlife women to look and be and accomplish certain things. So let's talk a little bit about how this idea of this animal behavior, this social comparison, these emotional responses, let's talk about it in the context of midlife. Sure. So first to understand the core biology. So animals are always comparing themselves to others because if you're in the weaker position, that could be a survival threat. And in fact, your survival depends on being in the stronger position. As I said, from nature videos, people may know that you only get quote unquote reproductive opportunity if you're in the position of strength. So we have inherited a a brain that's always looking to be in the position of strength and to avoid the position of weakness. And in fact, treats it like it's a matter of life and death. And when we're in the position of strength, our serotonin is stimulated and it actually paves a neural pathway that says, this is the way to feel good. So whatever stimulated your serotonin in your past why are you to say that's the way to feel good? So one person feels superior in one way and one person feels superior in another way. And a simple example is um, when I was in high school, nail polish was not worn. It was not the cool thing. And so like, I don't care what you think of my nails, you know, (laughs) because that wasn't wired in my youth. And yet there are other things that I'm doing the comparison thing on. Now, my mother had other things. So she saw it as a matter of life or death that I did X and didn't do Y. And now my daughter has her life or death responses. So we believe our own brains. So when they turn on those happy chemicals or unhappy chemicals, we think, whoa, it really must matter. And yet we don't even realize that this is just like some random neural pathway that was created by your random individual experience. And once you're in midlife, I think you've seen, you have enough perspective, you've seen enough variety in life that you could start to question and say, you know, I care so much about X, but my friend doesn't care at all about it. And yet my friend cares so much about Y and I don't care all that much about that. And you ask other people and you see that In their childhood, that was a big thing. And in your childhood, something else was a big thing. So you see that it's learned. So why waste the second half of your life torturing yourself over these just random wirings? Mm. That is such a great question. Why (laughs) torture yourself? (laughs) Right? And I love that you, you pointed that out. And that's where the power is in my mind. Why torture yourself? right? This is something that you say can be changed. So let's talk about that. So building a new pathway in adulthood is as hard as learning a foreign language in adulthood. Okay. So if you were to learn a new language, you would expect that it's going to take like a real lot of repetition and study. And you probably don't even want to do that. And yet occasionally some people do. You also know that if you try to reactivate the language you learned in youth or a language similar to one you learn in youth, 
that those core pathways are there because when we're young, we have a substance called myelin, which is like the asphalt on your neural pathways that makes them super big pathways. And when you use your big pathways, electricity flows effortlessly. And that's why it just feels true and natural and normal and correct when you rely on those old pathways, even when you know they're wrong. So the challenge, how do you build a new pathway? It's as hard as learning a foreign language, which means in one word, repetition. Mm -hmm. So if I decide, now the first thing people might say, I'm not going to compare myself to others, but you are. I'm telling you, you're going to do it because you've inherited a brain that does that. So the first step is self-acceptance, to accept that I am comparing myself to others rather than just thinking that everybody else is judging me. And that's so liberating to know that I'm doing it. So then the next step is to try to understand that my social comparison was learned and think about, well, how did I learn it? Well, there was this parent and this teacher and this aunt and uncle and this experience in high school. And then you see how that was learned and how you're always choosing those pathways and then you could learn your power to what i call it building an exit ramp from your old highway and then building a new highway and that takes a lot of repetition and before you can build a new highway you have to decide what it's going to be because you have to repeat the same thing a lot in order to construct it and what it's going to be in very very simple terms i say is I'm going to put myself up without putting others down. And that's hard. (laughs) Mm. Put yourself up without putting other people down. You know, it's, there is that self-acceptance piece and just really being at peace with where we are right now, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. But your inner mammal first is the piece of just knowing I'm not a bad person for thinking this way because you're already putting yourself down. When you understand how many times a day you're putting yourself down, then you could stop doing it. And then you could stop thinking that the world is putting you down because you are doing it and you can just stop. But that's not enough because your inner mammal really will want the position of strength and it will keep looking for it and it will keep being tempted to put other people down in order to put yourself up. And that's the challenge. When you talk about be learning to put ourselves up without putting other people down, in my mind, I'm picturing how sometimes we're taught what is good, right, success, you know, and I think learning how to separate ourselves from what we've learned about those things and invest, giving ourselves space to investigate what do we think about body image, success, you know, what our children do or don't do with their lives, how much do we hang our happiness on other people and what they're choosing to do and how that reflects on me. I feel like it's a very um, self, it can be very selfish because now we're, we're the center of the universe. And, and, and if we're not careful, everything else has to go our way or else we're unhappy. I think that's part of the suffering too. So in self-acceptance, I think there's that we're duplicated by a million, right? Everybody's kind of in this place. So how do we rephrase our self-talk? How do you start that journey? Because I don't know that people are even aware they're saying these things to themselves. Great, exactly. And when you raise the very good example about sort of hanging your hat on what your children do. So let's say that you are in an interaction, you run into some other person it could be a woman, but it could not be a woman. Um, and they let you know how fabulous their child is doing. Or, <laughs> or they let you know how fabulous their new health plan is doing. Or how fabulous the new vacation that they're taking. And so you have a one down feeling from that. So you created that one down feeling. But you can blame them for, quote unquote, making you feel that way. So then um, the positive way of looking at it is to say, I get to decide, like, if 
If that person is really doing that all the time, I don't have to spend that much time with them. But maybe they're not doing it as much as I think. Maybe I'm just projecting that onto them because I'm already one doubting myself on that score. So that's like step one. Then step two is to say, we all have a limited number of energy, a limited amount of energy. And if I totally focus my life on what being in a one-up position about this one thing, I might make some progress, but then I would have no energy left to focus on this other thing. And that's the mindset that many people have. You know, when you see the other person having a great vacation, you say, yeah, but I'm better than them about this other thing. When you see someone whose children are a superstar, you say, yeah, but I'm ahead. So we are always comparing. So again, the first step is to be conscious of it and then conscious of the emotional weight that we're giving it to stop projecting it onto other people or onto society And then to say, how lucky I am to have a choice about where I invest my thoughts and where I invest my energy and which thing is important to me. And and that's not so easy because even when you decide I'm going to invest, let's use a cliche. So the person decides, instead of doing that, I'm going to do yoga and be an artist. But of course... The minute you're in the yoga class, everybody there is all judgy wudgy. And the natural mammalian behavior is all we yoga people are going to feel superior to all of those non-yoga people. (laughs) But, But still, you're still in that yoga class comparing yourself to others. So it's always part of that mammal brain. And we have to really uh, work hard to find our power over it. It feels like it feels like we have to almost get outside of ourselves and learn to observe what just happened. Like, what did I say? What just happened? And getting a different perspective on it. Like, I think we have to shift our perspective, don't we? We have to begin to question what we're thinking. We be, have to begin to question, like, do I actually care? Yes, yes, yes. Um, but you do care. Because caring is an old neural pathway Mm. and it's finding your power to say, oh, I just flowed into an old neural pathway, not because it's true, but because it's big and the electricity in your brain flows into the biggest pathways unless you slam on the brakes and invest a tremendous amount of energy that's required to redirect your electricity into smaller pathways. And uh, if I may give uh, an example, sure. So um, when I talk about, so your pain pathways are the biggest pathways in your brain because whatever triggered your threat chemicals when you were young built giant pathways in the same way that an animal is always looking for threats, looking for predators, and they have to learn what are the the signals of a predator. So anything that triggered your cortisol, the stress chemical when you were young, built huge neural pathways that are always making you look for that. And you don't love that. And yet you keep doing it. So my example of what what you just said about having to stop and discover this, um, gosh, I was already like practically you know, late fifties or 60. Um, uh, when, (laughs) when I figured that out, I'm trying, yeah, maybe 55. So I had just gotten back. I had just taken like the dream of a lifetime vacation and I was at the hotel planning to leave the, the next morning. And I was really excited to go home. So I had every reason to be happy because I had a great vacation, but I was also happy to be going home. And yet I had this stab of anxiety, like this extreme anxiety. What's going on? So I had to literally think what happened to me a minute ago, two minutes ago, three minutes ago. And it was so obvious It was only like three to five minutes ago. And by the way, cortisol, it lasts in your body a whole hour. So once your cortisol is triggered, it stays in your body and you you keep feeling bad. And you have to say, 
what triggered it. So it turns out, uh, long story short, that um, just three minutes earlier, we were in the restaurant in the ground floor of our hotel and I had just taken the elevator up to our room and my husband had a little contretemps with the, uh, with the waiter. And I understood I, my husband's perspective, but yet I grew up with so much conflict that like this, I felt that this waiter had a, like a, gave a dirty look like angry. Um, but it was the smallest like split second of a dirty look that you could say maybe I even projected onto him that he was angry at us. And when I was young, I grew up with so much fear and anger that it only took a split second of conflict to trigger that cortisol in me and to give me like a, you know, a good half hour of bad feelings. It metabolizes, you know, gradually. Like, even though I knew that I was happy. Mm. Isn't that amazing, though? Because it's it's like our brain is moving at such a pace and it's picking up on all of these things that we aren't technically seeing. Like, we're seeing it, but it's being caught. The subconscious is filtering everything we see and everything we hear through our known universe, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes, and your known universe is not necessarily remembered with your conscious mind. It's just real physical pathways. Mm. And I think that leads to why people feel physical sensations in certain contexts, right? Yes. Butterflies, upset stomach, headaches, that kind of stuff. Yes, they're repeating an old response because You've heard the cliche neurons that fire together, wire together. So a simple example, like when I was young, a lot of the conflict was around the dinner table. So, you know, a lot of people. So if you had anxiety associated with eating, then you repeat that because it's just a pathway in your brain. Mm. And we do. Some people will avoid that situation, whatever mirrors that memory with everything that's in their being and other people have more of a warrior response, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, they're going to repeat it because they're going to try to conquer it. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's interesting. Like in my case, there was a lot of anger responses to how things were dealt with when I was growing up. So anger was like a, a normal behavior, if you will, in the adults in my life. Now, as an adult, was it every day? No, but it was strong enough that that was a very strong thing. So I found that being not able to express my emotions because the adults weren't able to help me, I went through a whole pattern of anger that was intense from about 18 to the most intense period was a good solid 10 years of my life. And in that time, I got married and I had a child and that really triggered it, not because the marriage was bad or the child was bad, because I didn't have tools. I did not have the tools and I had to figure that out. So when you talk about the hard work, I just wanted to say that this was before the Internet. This was before Google. This was before every, you know, this whole there was some personal development, but this was early 90s. Like we're talking 90, 91. It was not as readily available. So. I feel like the tools that the people hearing your voice now, the tools that they have, yes, it's hard work, but oh my gosh, Dr. Loretta, I didn't have all of that. And I know the hard work that it is, but you know, the, re the rewards far, far outweigh the struggle in the long run. So I just needed to kind of endorse the whole like, gosh, the resources are there. So many resources. So what you're saying is, yeah, it's hard work. And what I'm saying is, yeah, but look at the resources. Yes. The problem, though, is that a lot of the resources are oriented toward victim feelings. They're training you to feel like that it's the world's fault and actually selling to the anger. The, the anger that you acknowledged is quite a natural response. And if you sell to other people's anger, you're going to sell more. And so many young people are ending up believing that their lives are awful today because so many people are appealing to that, that belief. Mm. 
there's kind of this whole movement about, you know, your inner goddess, lion, power. I don't know. There's all kinds of words that go with it. And I feel like there's something in the middle, right? We have the capacity to change. That's your message. Uh, But it's hard in in the same sentence. (laughs) But everybody has that ability if they choose to tap into it. Exactly, exactly. Um, And when you said about how to, um, there's something in the middle, that's exactly the conclusion of the book. I call it life in the middle lane. Mm -hmm. So the fast lane has its obvious problems. The slow lane has its obvious problems. The middle lane is where you make conscious decisions about where you invest your energy and which thoughts you allow and which thoughts you redirect. And that means sometimes it's worth investing my energy to seek the one-up position in this particular area. Now, some listeners may say, oh, I never care about the one-up position. I only want to put others first. I think it's wrong to have an ego. And that's one of the philosophies that's disseminated today. But your inner mammal doesn't feel that way. So when you watch um, nature videos, you see that they don't get the banana if they're in the position of weakness. They don't get the mating opportunity if they're in the position of weakness. So if you are always giving the other people the banana, you are doing it because you expect them to say, oh, no, no, that's fine. You have the banana. And if they don't say that, you're furious at them and you feel like your survival is threatened. Everybody's putting me down and it's so unfair, but I don't have a choice because I'm too good to care about getting the banana. Which is the one up position, technically. The one up position in your own mind. Yes. So you, and this is the other big um, element of the book. If you wait for the world to applaud you, it's not going to happen and you're going to be upset all the time. So I go through a lot of famous historical figures to show that people who have achieved things did not have the applause of the world. And today there's sort of this illusion that you're supposed to get support and nurturing and anyone who achieves anything has a team and they're always getting supported. This is an illusion. And many people are bitter and resentful. So this whole belief system just ends up with more bitterness and resentful. So the bottom line is you can find in yourself to feel good about what you're doing. And if you wait for the world to applaud it, you're just going to end up hating the world and then you're not going to do anything. And then the world is not even going to have anything to applaud you at at all. Mm. You know, we've learned so many things by the time we hit midlife, haven't we? And we've cemented those neural pathways in many, many ways. And it's difficult to, I think, sometimes admit Wouldn't you say that it's difficult to turn and face those things? Yes, it is. But um, what makes it easier is first to know that everybody does this. Everybody cemented old neural pathways. So what I view, and you're right, it's uh, people call it the Vietnam syndrome. Like I already invested so much in X, so I better keep investing in that. But another way I looked at it is, when I was young, I was always running, putting out fires. Like I, you know, had to pick up my kids at work and then I couldn't deal with anything deeper because the timing was so tight that if I got upset, I didn't want to get upset in front of my kids. I didn't want to be late for work. I was always rushing from one thing to another that I couldn't experiment. So sometimes when you experiment, bad feelings come out from the past. Or sometimes when you try something new, You're not good at it and bad feelings come up. So it takes a little breathing room to experiment with wiring in new pathways. And so we're very lucky to live long enough to have this second life. Mm. You know, as you're talking about those younger years when all the things were happening, I feel like midlife has its own bucket of all the things, at least for me. And I know a lot of marriages struggle at this season in life. And a lot of um, parents are failing or children are struggling. We're in a very different world right now. There's a whole different situation for us in midlife. And I feel that there's like a need to shift time, if you will. 
Like it's time to begin to recognize where you fit in your own life because we've lived a lot of years, like you said, putting our emotions and our, th- our needs or whatever on the back burner. Maybe not everyone has done this, but I know a lot of women. It's hard to shift from, if you have children, it's hard to shift from being the wife, the mother, the daughter, to being the individual who maybe says, I'm going to set a boundary here. I'm going to make a different decision than I've made for the last 50, 60 years. That I think is the big thing, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And to do it without anger, but with the pleasure of saying, I'm so lucky I have a choice. The choice is a little bit threatening and risky, but I have confidence in my own strength. And actually that's serotonin. Serotonin is confidence in your own strength. That's what your inner mammal is looking for. And that's, that's why we're all trying to one up each other because the serotonin feels good. You get, when you have confidence in your own strength, your brain feels like, oh, I'm going to survive. And that's all it's looking for. And in fact, our human brain knows that we're not going to survive. And this is the pain of being human, that you have a mammal brain that's constantly pressuring you to survive and a human brain that knows that you're not going to survive. And needless to say, in midlife, that's even more challenging. So because our time is limited, we need to really understand ourselves. And my, my earlier book is called Habits of a Happy Brain and is how to stimulate dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphin. And the new book is only about serotonin. But the only way to be happy is to stimulate your happy chemicals. And there's lots of bad ways to stimulate them that we learn when we're young. And so we're lucky to live long enough to have the opportunity to rewire ourselves. Earlier, you said what fires together, wires together. And that particular idea is really connected so strongly to our emotions, right? It's our emotions that lock that neural pathway. Exactly. You think of emotions are like paving on your neural pathway. They actually strengthen the neurons in five different ways. That's explained in my first book, Habits of a Happy Brain, so that the electricity flows so easily down the neural pathway that you don't feel like you've chosen that thought out of your billions of neurons and out of the endless inputs into your senses, but it just feels true. And the simple example of that when you're born, you don't know what food is, you don't know what people are, but you cry because you have low blood sugar. Somebody brings you food and you hear footsteps. And the next time you hear that sound, you feel good because your brain expects that your needs will be met when you hear that sound, but you still don't know what milk is and you still don't know what your mother is. Mm. It's just a pathway. (laughs) The interesting thing about that is if an emotion can cement maybe a pattern we don't like, it's shifting that emotion to create a new neural pathway, right? We do need to, what do they call it? You kind of, you don't get rid of it. You weaken it, diminish it and rebuild. Is that correct? Well, unfortunately the old pathway is always there, but it's, I mean, you know, there's debate about that, how much strong is, but it's strengthening the alternative pathway. And here's a very simple example. Let's say here's a simple example. You and I, We'll finish this conversation. And in the minute I log off, my brain will have to make a decision about what I will do next. So the easiest thing would be just to go into whatever is my natural automatic response, unless I plan a new response and say, okay, the next time I have a free moment, instead of choosing to go to the refrigerator or to call someone up and yell at them if that's the person's habit or whatever a person automatically does. And then to plan, okay, my new plan is when I have a free moment, I'm going to do this and this and this. And then if you uh, consciously repeat that, it will connect neurons and start to be your go-to, but it will take a while to feel natural. So what I hear you saying is we have to get off autopilot. (laughs) we need to start becoming aware of what we're doing, 
maybe even why we're doing it because you it still might be back to that emotional reward right like it may not be giving us a lifetime reward but in the moment there's an emotional reward exactly and um when you say get off autopilot the first step is self acceptance so we're designed to run on autopilot um and if you think about like a gazelle is, you know, looking for food, looking for the herd so it doesn't get separated, looking for predators. And we only have a small part of our bandwidth. Oh, the simple example is when you're driving. You could drive and listen to the radio. But if something goes wrong, then you're totally focused on what's gone wrong and you don't hear what's said on the radio. So most of us runs on autopilot, but we have this little bandwidth left over for emergencies. And when you're watching Netflix, you're not using that bandwidth, but you if you decide that you want to redirect yourself, then you got to use it. But maybe it's scary to use it because you're used to keeping it available to listen for predators. Mm, that's so fascinating. And it really does remind me of, you know, goal setting and habits if we're on autopilot which you're right it's a it's a brain energy saving thing that's good unless the habits aren't good <laughs> and then we have to become aware right so that we can shift the habit and i think when you talk about self acceptance dr loretta i think that there's also this come to jesus meeting we need to have with ourselves which is do I really want to change this? Like, I might need to accept that I may not like this neural pathway, but I'm just unwilling to do something about it. And there's some acceptance in that too, not being a victim, but being like, hey, Gina, you can't keep complaining and not changing. That's my personality. It's like, well, if you're not going to change it, quit complaining because clearly it doesn't mean enough. This is me talking to myself, you know, so I yes. can shift my focus. Yes, but um, uh, just to help, if somebody is struggling with addiction, for example, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, they, they think they want to change and yet they keep not changing. So if you think of addiction as like, it's often a very big part of your life. So it feels so big, like, how can I change that? So many people will think, well, I want to change, but I've tried and I've failed and I just don't get how. So the idea of all of my books is to break it into small chunks. So the smallest possible chunk, what are you addicted to? Let's just use a simple example of video games because it's easy for us mature women who are not addicted to video games for the most part to, <laughs> to work through this one. Before a person starts playing the video game, there's that split second when they make the decision to go to pick up the video game I'm going to play. And so the first step is to discover that split second. And if you think about what happened one split second before that moment when you reached for the video game or the whatever is your bad habit, what was going on then? And that's your neural pilot. Um, that's your pattern. Now, many people have many patterns. A simple example with an alcoholic would say, well, we drink when we're happy. We drink when we're sad. We drink when we're busy. We drink when we're free, you know, but they're basically separate patterns that your brain is basically, we're all generating bad feelings all the time because we live in a world where our brain is looking for threat. And we all know that our life is finite and something's going to get us someday. So. The second I have free time, my brain is going to look for something bad unless I really grab the reins and build a habit. And you talked about goal setting, you know, that to say, how can I focus on something good and rewarding, but a healthy reward rather than either rushing into an unhealthy reward or letting bad things overcome me? And then rushing into the unhealthy reward as an excuse, like, oh, the world is so bad. Why not have another martini? Yes, I understand what you're saying. You're using the word addiction in some sense in this particular example as the, the habit we run to, to self-soothe. You know? Exactly. And that can be so many things, can't it? Exactly. 
Yes. And we all have self-soothing habits and we need them. So the focus of my work is to help you build many self-soothing habits and healthy self-soothing habits so you don't over-rely on whatever it is like. The cliche is that you're at work and you get up and walk to the candy machine just because you're tired of your work. And the only way you know to break it up is to walk to the candy machine. Mm, Yeah. Instead of maybe taking a walk outside or whatever. Habits are so powerful. They really are. But there's, to me, there's, there's encouragement in that. Because while habits are hard, like it's hard to break a habit. Nevertheless, because of the way our brains work, we can impact change in our own habits. We just have to be alert and aware to what and why. Exactly. You, you don't break a habit, but you substitute a new habit. So you have to consciously design the new habit. And when it comes to social comparison, you can consciously design a new habit for thinking about social comparison. I'll give you another interesting example. So my mother grew up in a culture where people wanted gold jewelry. So when I was in high school, that was, you know, very passe. People did not want to do that. So I had the pressure from my mother to wear gold jewelry, which I did not want. But then I was also exposed to like my mother always put herself down. She felt that people who had more gold jewelry were looking down at us. So I was very much raised with this uh, response of people looking down at me. So even though I was too cool to wear gold jewelry, but I still had this deeply wired response of automatically assuming that people were looking down at me. Yes. And I think everyone probably has like that situation that triggers that, oh yeah, that was my thing. And that's an interesting point. Not that our parents and grandparents were bad per se, but they were influenced. And so we have these generational weird (laughs) kind of glitches in the way that we see the world or, you know, the things that we believe. And you said this earlier on, it doesn't mean they're true. Not every thought we think is true, even if we've thought it for 50 years. Exactly. And what I talk a lot about in the book, many people are told today that our society is the problem. And they think that in some earlier society, and some pre-industrial society that everybody loved each other all the time and felt equal. And it's not true. They had very rigid hierarchies. They had very little choice. And it's the same in animal groups. And I was trained, um, I was a a docent at my local zoo and I was trained in um, the animal brain. And it's like, wow, nobody tells you this stuff. But animals are very competitive and nasty to each other. And then you could appreciate how hard we're working to restrain these impulses instead of having some utopian notion that everything was happy in the past and now something has gone wrong. Changing the narrative. As we bring our conversation to a close, Dr. Loretta, I would love to have three anchor points to help my midlife audience really apply and understand what it is you shared with us today? Where can they start? Great. Well, so first, our brain is wired by the rewards and threats we experience in our early years. And so every one of us has quirky wiring. So no one should think I got the bad brain and other people are happy all the time. Our brain is not designed to release happy chemicals all the time. It only releases them when you see a way to meet a survival need, however that was defined in your own childhood. So then um, we have the power to change this wiring, but it's very hard. It takes a lot of repetition. And finally, when you do try to change, it feels weird at first because the old pathway conducts your electricity so easily that when you don't go there, you feel like you're hurting yourself, even though going there is hurting you. So when you know it's just a pathway, and that if you keep repeating the new choice, that pathway will build and your electricity will flow there more easily. And that will start to feel natural. But it has to come from inside you, no one else can give it to you. And no one can do it for you. 
I like that. The electricity flow will begin to feel more natural. And I think that's the point with change, right? We need to accept the fact that change isn't going to feel good at first, but it will eventually begin to feel better, especially if we're looking for different outcomes in our lives. We have yeah, to. not only will it feel better, but it will feel start to feel effortless. Like somebody said, said I forgot to smoke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that that'd be pretty awesome because I know a lot of people that smoking is a hard habit to break. Exactly. But you know what else is a hard habit to break? It's a hard habit to break being a victim. It's a hard habit to break being that person who has no power. Absolutely. And I feel and like- that's an addiction. Mm, good way to put it. And I think for my midlife audience, as we wrap up here, if we find ourselves thinking that way, being the martyr or the victim, I think from my perspective, we have to let that stuff go. We have to begin to really recognize that it's time to stop. It's time to start a new kind of life. And this brain science gives us a driver's seat. It gives us a vehicle to drive. Exactly. Exactly. So powerful. Well, Dr. Loretta, I want to thank you so much for coming on my show today, for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and just so honestly addressing something that impacts everyone and normalizing the conversation in a way that you're acknowledging the truth, but you're also showing the hope. And I really appreciate that. Well, thanks so much for putting together this great audience. Yeah, they are great, aren't they? You know, we have so much to offer in our midlife, don't we? Yes. We brought so much along. So in fact, many people are worried about um, getting fired. And once you're retired, it's like, wow, I'm one of the few people in the world that just doesn't have to worry about getting fired. So that's the, the benefit that we can contribute. Yeah. And then use our time in a way that really benefits us and our families and our world in the way that maybe we've never had a chance to do before. Exactly. Now, how can people find you, Dr. Loretta? So my website is innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And I have lots and lots of free resources and also links to all of my books and links to my podcast. And I have videos that explain self-soothing and I have a five-day free happy chemical jumpstart. And your podcast is called The Happy Brain? Yes. And the website is happybrainpodcast.com. Excellent. Thank you. Today, friends, I've been speaking with Dr. Loretta Bruning. She is a brain chemistry expert, the founder of Inner Mammal Institute, the author of Status Games, Why We Play and How to Stop. And she's a podcaster. Um, her podcast is called The Happy Brain. And if you head over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 249, I will have links to all of these things. And her other book that she mentioned will also have a link there for you. And while you're there, please leave your name and email address. Join my email list. I send out periodic encouraging emails. Friends, this is a powerful conversation. It's an encouraging conversation. It is not an easy task, but it is a possible task. If you find that your life is not heading in a direction that you want it to head, or you have habits that you wish would change, the hopeful message is you can, and there are resources to help you do it. And your own brain is neuroplastic. These things can be done. So figure it out. What is it that you want to change? And then get the resources and do the work. I promise you, I promise you, you will not regret moving in a direction that's going to make you healthier, happier, more productive, especially in your second half of life. Let's do this thing of growing and growing in grace and growing in strength and growing in the changes that benefit us as we grow older. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to sharing more with you in the future. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.